In this video, we're going to do an independent events example. This example comes directly from one of the sample questions that uh, the Society of Actuaries has posted for exam P. Uh, so let's read through the question together. When I see the question, see how long the question is, the first thing I do on these long questions is I read the last sentence first. So I kind of have an idea of what it is I'm going to be looking for as I read the rest of the question. So that's a, especially on these long questions, it's a good idea to read the last sentence first. So, uh, the last sentence is calculate the probability that an automobile owner purchases neither collision nor disability coverage. Okay, so then we go back and read the question. An actuary studying the insurance preferences of automobile owners makes the following conclusions. An automobile owner is twice as likely to purchase collision coverage as disability coverage. The event that an automobile owner purchases collision coverage is independent of the event that he or she purchases disability coverage. And the probability that an automobile owner purchases both collision and disability coverages is 15%. Okay, and again, we're looking for the probability that an automobile owner purchases neither collision nor disability coverages. Now, you don't need to know what collision coverage means and disability coverage means. You don't need to know what those two things are. Uh, you'll learn that later on in a, a, another course. Uh, but just know that those are, are, are different coverages that you can purchase uh, as an automobile uh, insurance customer. Okay, so all of these general probability uh, uh, questions I set up with a Venn diagram. So I'll set my Venn diagram up here with my events cap C that the customer or, or the owner uh, purchases collision coverage and cap D that the owner uh, purchases uh, disability coverage. And again, I'm looking for the probability here, if I look, read the question, the probability that the automobile owner purchases neither collision nor disability means uh, the person does not purchase collision and the per person does not purchase disability coverage. So the event then is C complement intersect D complement. Okay, I look at the answer choices. Now, I don't know how to populate the Venn diagram just yet, so I look at the answer choices and I look at the probabilities and I kind of make a guess on what I think I should start with, how many people I should start with in my survey. And so I start with 100. I'm thinking 100 will clear out some fractions. Let's just see what happens. And again, I'm not worried about getting decimals. I've addressed that in a previous video that, uh, you know, the decimals, because I'm calculating a probability if I get decimal values, it just the decimals will, will will cancel off and, and I'll just uh, get the same result. Okay, so I'm starting with 100 people in my survey and I want to start from the inside out on the intersection of C and D and actually they gave me that information there in part three. They said the probability that an automobile owner purchases both collision and disability coverages is, is, is 15%. So 15% of those 100 or 15 would be uh, in the intersection of C and D. Now at this point they didn't give me enough information to numerically populate the rest of my Venn diagram, so I just use letters again to populate uh, some of these values. So I'll use uh, letters X and Y here. And so I've got, uh, uh, I've got the Venn diagram populated this way, this way. and notice that uh, outside of, of C and D, uh, I have 85 minus X minus Y, so that when I add all of those, uh, all of those numbers together, I get one, the 100 that I started with in the sample. And now the probability that I'm looking for is the probability of C, uh, the, the uh, uh, complement of C intersect the complement of D. So they're not in C and they're not in D. And so that would be the number in, in, in uh, outcomes in that event would be the 85 minus X minus Y. And so I'm dividing that by uh, the 100 that I'm starting with. Now, I notice that 85 minus X minus Y, I'm going to rewrite it as an 85 minus an X plus Y just to make an observation that I don't really need to know what the X value is. I don't need to know what the Y value is. I need to know what the X plus Y value is. So uh, I'm, I'm keeping that in the back of my mind. But I'm going to go ahead and distribute out the minus sign and go back to this, to this line. Now let's see what other information that we have here. So if I look at, at part one, it says an automobile owner is twice as likely to purchase collision as disability coverage. So that means there's twice as many people in set C as there are in set D. And so when I look at well, how many people are in set D, I have Y plus 15 is in set D, X plus 15 is in set C, that's how many outcomes are in set, uh, uh, set C, event C, and it says an automobile insurance, uh, an automobile owner is twice as likely to purchase collision 
uh, coverage as disability. So a X plus 15 would be two times the Y plus 15. Okay, what other information do I have? Well, I have that second point is that the event that an automobile owner purchases a collision is independent of the event that he or she purchases disability coverage. So that tells me that the probability of C intersect D is just the product of the probability of C and the probability of D. Now the probability of C intersect D, there are 15 outcomes in C intersect D out of the 100. And then the probability of C is X plus 15 over 100 and the probability of D is Y plus 15 over 100. Okay, so now I, I look at this and I, I try to piece together the information that I have. Uh, and I, I recognize that the uh, X plus 15 is two times the Y plus 15. So I could substitute that in. And what I get then when, after I substitute that in is on the right hand side of that, uh, of that equal sign where I have the uh, 15 over 100 equals, I get that it's equal to two times Y plus 15 squared divided by 100 squared. So now, if you solve that equation for y, that's just easy to solve for y. Um, multiply over by, I would multiply both sides by 100 squared to clear, clear out the 100 squared in the denominator. And what you would get on the other side of that is uh, the 15 over 100 times 100 squared would give me 1,500. Then I need to divide that by 2. I'd get 750, take the square root of that and subtract 15. So it looks like to me that y is equal to the square root of 750 uh, divided by 15. And now if I plug that in for Y in what I have highlighted in red, so add 15 to it and I get, I just get two times the square root of 750 and then uh, to solve for X I need to subtract 15 from that. So I get the X value here of uh, two times square root of 750 minus, minus 15. Okay, uh, and then when I plug those in for X and Y, I get, I get these values. I, I just get a, a 0.328 number as that probability that I seek. So my answer choice is, is B. Uh, a couple of observations. I made the observation earlier that uh, when I see the 85 minus X minus Y, I could write that as an 85 minus an X plus Y. So it was the X plus Y that I really needed. I don't really need the X or the Y individually. But in this particular problem, I was able to actually find the X and the Y individually. And so I ended up, uh, I end up with, with this. Um, another observation that I want to make here is... Um, well, look, that's my answer. So I'm going to make a couple of observations, and I got a little funny story that I'd like to tell you. But uh, you know, if you're if you want to move on, that's I'm done with the problem. We've we've we finished the problem. Uh, however, those values of x and y that I see there, those are are, are irrational numbers. And one thing that that tells me uh, is that uh, there's no value for n that you're going to start with that when you multiply uh, uh, that, that you're going to end up with integer numbers for X and Y. Uh, no value of N will give you integer values for X and Y. And what that tells me is the 15% in part three there, that 15% that, uh, that is just a rounded off number. It wasn't really 15%, it was some other number. Um, but you don't need to know any of that stuff. The X and Y are, uh, like I said, uh, irrational numbers. So that's kind of, uh, you know, uh, how would you like to be considered an irrational number? Uh, so I, that's kind of what I wanted to finish with was this kind of funny story. So I'm going to lead up to it by talking about, you know, these irrational numbers. So you have irrational numbers and rational numbers. I, you know, that's, I don't know who named them irrational, uh, but you have a lot more irrational numbers than rational numbers, actually. So that's, you know, kind of disturbing, too, in, in a way. So... Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure that uh, I would want to be known as an irrational number. Uh, in fact, if, uh, if, if you were, uh, uh, were going to label me a number, uh, I don't think I would want to be called an odd number either. So even the integers are odd and even. So I think I'd like to be called, I'd like to be more even than odd, considered odd. And uh, of course, I'd like to be prime. And so uh, the only number there that I'm left with, I think, is a number two. So if I was a number, I think I'd like to be a number two. That way I'm a prime. I'm prime. Uh, I'm real, I'm prime, and uh, uh, I'm not odd. So, uh, yeah, so I don't know who gets into numbering, uh, into naming these, these numbers. It, you know, it gets even worse. You get these imaginary numbers, but, you know, aren't they all kind of imaginary? If you think about it, aren't, aren't all the numbers imaginary? But no, if you look at, you know, like the number 15, that's real, that's real. But 15 times the square root of negative one is imaginary. So, uh, I don't know, they're all kind of imaginary to me. 
But uh, then they get into complex numbers, and some people probably would think they're all, all numbers are probably complex, uh, but complex numbers would have a real part and then an imaginary part. So anyway, that gets me to my story. Uh, uh, I went to, uh, when I was in graduate school, I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana at LSU. And in the men's room, uh, I'm sorry, in, in the uh, math building, when you walk in, there's a men's room on, the, on, on one side and a women's room on the other side. Uh, I think it was called Lockett Hall was the name of that building. So if you find yourself in, in Baton Rouge, uh, look up Lockett Hall and, and see if what I'm about to tell you is still true. So uh, when you walked in, though, uh, again, the men's room was on one side and the women's room was on the other side. And somebody had taken a magic marker and above men wrote the word real and above women wrote the word complex. And so uh, when you walk into the uh, lobby there, you see a real men's restroom and a complex women's restroom. So I thought that was, uh, that was pretty clever. Okay, so uh, anyway, that, uh, that, that's, that's my story for the day. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it, if you stuck around to listen to it. And I'll see you in the next video.